million. I can feel that it has my name on it already. Let's do it. Yeah. Hey, our panelists, we're actually at the top of the hour, so I'm going to kick us off if, if good for everyone. Fantastic. Awesome. So welcome to our session. I am thrilled to be here with such a strategic and special focus on Atlanta here today with the magnificent conference that is held annually by 500 startups. I am Christy Brown. I'm the president of Launchpad 2X. We are a female founder to CEO Accelerator headquartered out of Atlanta. And today our topic is discussing with stakeholders in this ecosystem in our diverse start startup ecosystem, our deep dive and how we've arrived, how we are and why we know that we're so special. So with that, I'm just gonna kick us off. Just the quick abstract of the panel that you're attending is these are four, three, including myself, or four, including myself, I mean, key stakeholders in the Atlanta ecosystem. And this conversation will actually focus on how we've changed over the years, how we predict Atlanta will step into and transform in, uh, from the pandemic into the future and how we've worked so hard in this region to make it a more inclusive startup ecosystem and other lessons that can be learned for cities who are doing the same to foster these diverse startup founders. So with that, um, I'm thrilled to have each one of these panelists here and I know them all well and the businesses that, that they're doing here in this startup ecosystem. So quickly, I'd love each of them to just spend a couple minutes telling who they are and what they're doing here in Atlanta. So why don't we start with you, Sid? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Christy. And good afternoon, everybody. And good morning, I guess, if you're on the West Coast. Uh, happy to be here. I'm Sid Mukherjee, founder and managing partner of Silicon Road Ventures. We are a $31 million uh, early stage fund, which is focused on making Atlanta the hub for commerce tech innovation. Uh, the fund was launched in 2019. We did our final close in February of 2021. And uh, we already have 10 startups in our portfolio, so we have been a bit busy there. Uh, I also run the Mukherjee Foundation, which is a private family foundation, which is also focused on entrepreneurship. <clears throat> Great gift from this foundation, uh, the retail tech vertical was launched at uh, Georgia Tech's ATDC. Uh, and then the uh, foundation also contributed to the Kennesaw State University and uh, they have started something called the Mukherjee Innovation Fund, uh, again, which gives grants to entrepreneurs uh, who are either students or alumni of KSU. Now, I'm also a founding partner of Creative Destruction Labs, uh, the Atlanta chapter of it, which was recently launched at Scheller. Um, and this was also enabled by a gift from the Mukherjee Foundation. And then if that was not enough, I run a family office, uh, Silver Spirit Global, uh, which invests in different areas, including uh, real estate, uh, I'm sitting in a building that the family office owns in Midtown Atlanta. Uh, and then, you know, I know we are going to talk about this later, Christy. I'm the incoming president of uh, Thai Atlanta. Uh, so we'll talk about that later on. And just quickly prior to this, uh, I built and um, ran a company called SPI that was focused also on retail e-commerce tech. And I ran the company for 22 years, uh, did 14 acquisitions, 3,000 people in eight countries, and sold to Cognizant. Uh, a few years ago. Thank you so much, Sid. How about Jay, we move to you next with your introduction. Sure, I mean, we've got such an underachiever, <laughs> you know, kicking us off. <laughs> so true. <laughs> hey family, Jay Bailey, president and CEO of the H.J. Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship uh, in Atlanta. We are building the largest center in the world dedicated to growing, scaling, developing black owned businesses. Uh, really living at the nexus of access, opportunity, and exposure, uh, bringing all the best resources in the world under one roof at 54,000 square feet. Uh, it's just the start. We also own the 42 acres around that building uh, in the heart of a Mecca that has more black and roll college students than any other city on the planet. Uh, I think you said it, Christy, earlier before we went live. There's something special happening in Atlanta. And I think having all these superstars on a pan panel, shame on us if we don't come together uh, and create something that history will never forget. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. I always appreciate your energy and enthusiasm. And finally, Lisa, and we're going to speak about Valor Venture later, but super excited to have Lisa. Do you mind doing an intro? 
Thanks, Christy. I am really excited about this whole room as I look who's with us as we're speaking. I mean, it is a diverse and amazing crowd. Uh, my background is all founder. I was raised in South Georgia, I'm the child of entrepreneurs working in that parent's business. In my 30s, I popped out of corporate where I was working in tech and I'm like, okay, I have the courage to try this. And I built a, a professional services firm that worked in tech for about 10 years, built it into a fairly sizable firm with a lot of good experiences helping startups scale and grow. But you know what I learned doing that was that for women and people of color, the path was just nowhere near the same. And so I wanted to create a venture capital firm that would truly learn to invest with bias. We all have bias. So instead of pretending that we don't have bias, I believe that bias can be actively managed, controlled, given a risk premium, and in that way, things that can appear very, very risky actually might be extremely financially rewarding. But today's venture capital industry tends to miss on those opportunities. So today, Valor Ventures is a growing team. We have just under $25 million under management. And across 17 investments, 80% of our founders are female or of color. And for us, it's just the beginning. So I'm really excited to share our story with y'all. Thank you so much. Just to quickly summarize and set the stage, Atlanta really is this interesting hub to a very spoke model across the Southeast. And we really invite and have a kind of a boom town of startups happening here from film and production to our first 5G testing track to a mobile car wash uh, SaaS based platform that um, engaged a few years ago. So there's all types of businesses that are occurring here and it's been on fire and it has increased in the past 10 or 12 years, um, starting with a, a little area we call um, Fifth Street, which is a, an innovation corridor. So we're really proud of all the big things that we have here. And the top four are a very strong educational platform, a deep talent pool, a significant support infrastructure from this community, and a massive inflow of money. So with that, there's no shortage of business occurring across Atlanta. So panel, I'm just gonna ask each of you the same question and I'm excited to hear the response. The question is, Atlanta has a gravitational pull to founders across the Southeast, in particular, and as the community continues to elevate companies that are hitting the billion dollar status. In fact, we've had three hit that mark over the past six months. In just a few short words, what's the largest driver in your opinion? And can we start with you, Sid? Yeah, <clears throat> sure. Uh, I mean, it's very tough to say it in very few words, Christy, but I'll try. So basically one is, of course, Atlanta is an economic powerhouse with the airport, probably the most connected city in the world. Um, you talked about the tech hub, you talked about um, the education which is here, but also I think the big factor which is driving people to Atlanta is the low cost of living compared to, um, you know, some of the big names in tech, right? So it's 48% lower than San Francisco and 57% lower than New York City. So uh, definitely Atlanta has a lot of great, uh, great things ahead of it. Thanks for that. How about you, Jay? What do you think? Oh, I mean, Atlanta is special. I love what Sid said. Uh, Atlanta is still affordable enough to dream. And, you know, what other city on the planet can you go from Ambassador Andrew Young to Andre 3000? Uh, I love Silicon Valley. I spent a lot of time out west. Cambridge, love what they're doing at Harvard and MIT. Love what they're doing in Nashville. Love what they're doing in Austin. Research Triangle. Atlanta's just cooler than all of them. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and I think that our culture and our community is part of our asset. Uh, that draws people here, not to mention our diversity, because you can take Silicon Valley, Austin, Nashville, all the others. None of them have gotten diversity right. And none of them have really figured out how to make innovation inclusive. And I think in Atlanta, we're uniquely positioned to do that, unlike any of the other hubs around the world and certainly in the United States. Um, you got to think, though, Atlanta, this ain't the first time Atlanta's changed the world. Um, during the civil rights movement, Atlanta led the charge to change the world without firing a single shot. Uh, back then, it was civil rights. Uh, but I think the next revolution and evolution will be economic. It will come through innovation. Uh, and I think Atlanta's poised to make a whole lot of noise. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. Lisa, your turn. 
Christy, you know, piggybacking off both these guys, I think inclusion is really our inspiration in Atlanta and, and what's driving these billion dollar companies. And, and we've got, you know, 25 more on the ground that we could each call out that are about to hit that mark. Mm-hmm. So if you look at the Southeast, and I know a lot of you are joining us from the Southeast, pure numbers, it's 40% of the US population. So we have the population density but we also have the population intensity that it's going to take to make the next innovation hub. So with a large percentage of our population diverse, we're really the only region in the country that has the DNA to create that multicultural, multiracial, multigender melting pot that breeds true innovation that the world needs for the future. I really don't think the Chamber of Commerce could have made a commercial any better than the four of us. Just did. <laughs> so with that, I would love, Jay, just um, to kind of lean in on you here with a first question. Atlanta has not been the most obvious place for entrepreneurship in its history, but it has been a driving force, as you said, in culture creativity, collaboration with the diverse founder community. Can you really chat with us a little bit about what's made Atlanta so special uh, is the adjective that I continue to use, but also why is this a key city for founders of color? Hmm. You know, and there are two ways I'll answer that, Christy. Uh, there's the, the lovey part that makes us feel good and the harsh reality that we have to combat. Um, Atlanta has been the black Mecca for many years. I mean, we've had consecutive black leadership in Atlanta for the past 46 years, uh, you know, with a population number of over 52 percent African-American in this city. Uh, it's the city of Morehouse, Spellman, Clark, Morris Brown, ITC, Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, Georgia State has more African-American enrolled college students than any other university on the, on the planet. Um, you know, the home of the civil rights movement. When you start talking about diversity and inclusion, the other construct that I push all of my corporate partners and I want people to start thinking about is more about belonging. And in Atlanta, if you're black, or if you're my, you know, certainly if we're talking about black founders, black entrepreneurs, Atlanta gives a sense of belonging that you really don't get anywhere else in the country. And so on the flip side of that, though, is the problem that we have solved for, because for all of the beautiful things that we have in our city, we still lead the country in income inequality. We still lead the country in economic immobility. A child born into poverty in Atlanta has less than a 4% chance of reaching the upper middle class. And when we start having a conversation about race, if we're afraid to have a conversation about race in a city that's 54% African-American, then we're we're being intellectually disingenuous in our approach to really try to move the needle. Because in this city, unfortunately, when you talk about class, you get race for free. And the vast majority of people that make up those deplorable statistics happen to be black. So it's that tale of two cities. But I think as an entrepreneur, I see that as upside potential, that we have so many on this side of the equation that can move somewhere towards the middle. But if we get them from the lower rung to the middle, you're talking about transformational change in the southeast through Atlanta. Agree wholeheartedly. Any other comments from the panel on that? Uh, no, I, I fully agree. I mean, the, the Jay said it very eloquently. Um, mm-hmm. you know, definitely, I, I fully agree that one of the strengths of Atlanta, actually, I wish more said it, uh, was is its diversity. Um, there are more, uh, you know, African American entrepreneurs, senior execs here than anywhere else, probably in the world. So, uh, you know, there's a lot to be said for this city. Thank you, Sid. And then to continue on in our discussion, Lisa, let's move move towards you and talk about Valor Ventures just for a moment. Valor Ventures really had the foresight on creating a venture fund headquartered out of Atlanta with a focus on underserved founders. Can you really explain the ambition to embrace this community of entrepreneurship, but why it has been such a win for this community of Atlanta? And now other funds target Atlanta with the same type investment thesis. So I'd love your insight on that. Well, it it is fun being an early mover. So Valor's first fund was launched in 2016. But the opportunity is is really a long-term opportunity. And I think, you know, echoing some of Jay's words, inclusion is really the next barrier of opportunity. And so when we can find ways to empower entrepreneurs, and, and I don't, 
you know, black entrepreneurs, Hispanic entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs from all kinds of groups that have been structurally uh, disentangled from power and money in America. We have to put that back together. And the city to, to break it and remake it, and we haven't done it yet, is Atlanta, but we're further along than anywhere else. And so, for example, you know, to speak to how Valor Ventures addresses this and get really you know, open and tactical with you all, we have something called an inclusion premium investing philosophy mm. that guides our investing. And it really puts in inclusion at the fore. It's not a we need to check boxes and make sure that we get this many of this many types of people because people don't fit into boxes. And if some of the, the civic engagement of the last few months has taught us anything, it's that people do not want to be boxed in by the culture or by a company. They want to be really uh, free to bring their full selves into operation and give the full gift of what they can do. And so the inclusion premium investing philosophy aims to help our stakeholders take advantage of the upside of backing incredible founders and help them continue to make an incredible company by having inclusion at the board level, at the leadership level, and at the team level. And, you know, it's it's a grand experiment that we're carrying out every day at Valor, and it's a real it's a real joy. And I invite you all to watch, watch how we're doing. Come join the fight. Come join the party. And if you've got a software business in the southeast looking for a seed round, come talk to us. Love it. I know we're going to talk about it later, but Startup Runway is is an entry point to get those companies through the door. So I know we're going to talk about it later in the discussion. Sid, let's look to you. And you mentioned this earlier, and I'm so glad that you did. But you're a longstanding member of TIE, which is a nonprofit global community that really focuses on entrepreneurs all over the world that has a tremendous presence in Atlanta, Atlanta, sorry, and it really focuses on five key pillars, mentoring, network, networking, education, incubation, and funding. So this year, I know that you're stepped in, you have stepped into the role of president of Thai, and it's really focused on the Atlanta ecosystem. Can you talk to us about the growth from a fiscal and growth perspective, how it's benefited this community and Thai uh, and really more the universal platform? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for letting me talk about that. Um, and I think everybody on this panel, and I think many of uh, the people that are listening in, uh, we all have been in situations where <laughs> we were at a disadvantage because of who we were, our backgrounds, right? And um, the problem is that there are not many organizations that actually help overcome those barriers. And that's what Thai is trying to do through a volunteer organization. Like you said, uh, the, the mission of Thai is fostering entrepreneurship globally uh, through things like mentoring, networking, investing, and education. <clears throat> um, so quickly about Thai itself, uh, it's a global organization, just uh, to be clear, 61 chapters in 14 countries worldwide. The Atlanta chapter is one of the top chapters, um, top five chapters. Uh, it's over 20 years old. And uh, essentially what Thai does is uh, in Atlanta, we provide entre uh, entrepreneurs opportunities for things like networking, right? So you get to meet people who are other entrepreneurs who have some of had exist, exit. Some of them are kind of in the middle of growth. Some of them are just starting off. Uh, academicians, functional experts, and even industry execs, so they all are part of Thai. And I know, Christy, you were also a member of Thai earlier. And so the charter members of Thai are very important to its success. Uh, we also have an angel investing group. Again, the objective of the angel investing group, more than the investing, is education, as well as also supporting diverse founders. So one example of that is the access program. So I just, if you don't mind, I'll talk for a minute about that. So the access program is a, a funding uh, opportunity for minority or women in businesses, which are only state seed or seed plus. <clears throat> and they have to have you know startups in the last five years and they have to be post revenue. So uh, last year we uh, gave the winners of this competition $300,000, uh, which are investments made to these companies. There were 51 applicants last year, okay, out of which there were 11 finalists. And out of them, 82% uh, were female and 62% were black. And they were from all the southeastern states, so Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and North Carolina. And uh, not along with the money, I think more importantly, uh, there's a lot of great coaching provided to the startups. So uh, I think that's that's really um, significant. So we are about to launch the 2021 
uh, edition of this. So uh, if you are listening in, you are an entrepreneur, uh, please apply if you if you'd like. Uh, other than that, uh, we also have uh, education for entrepreneurship. So one of the biggest successes of Thai has been what we call the uh, Thai Young Entrepreneurs, where high school students are provided a 16-week every Sunday kind of uh, education program, and it creates some amazing uh, capabilities in these little in these kids, uh, high school kids, and also there's a college uh, edition of that as well. And then uh, finally. Uh, I also has informal board uh, capability that they provide called the Council of Board Advisors or COBA uh, for mid-sized entrepreneurs. So somebody who's kind of stuck with you know five seven million dollars of revenue doesn't know how to really scale from there. Uh, you know, seasoned entrepreneurs will participate on the board, etc. So again, so lots of great things happening with Thai Atlanta, and uh, I'd like to invite everybody here to become a member. <laughs> We want everyone to come to Atlanta and start their businesses. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sid. Um, Jay, when we really look at your profile, we know that you are deeply an entrepreneur at heart and you've really utilized your growth to promote others, primarily through financial literacy, which is absolutely essential when we discuss wealth equity and the future this creates for Atlanta. And you alluded to this earlier, so I was excited that you opened uh, into this for us. When we look at what uh, Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship is doing and what the mission to our community is and the speculative growth, can you really chat quickly about the impact it creates for our future of entrepreneurship to the Atlanta community? You know, every every town has a north side of the tracks and a south side of the tracks. <laughs> You know, I've said it now because it's kind of become a catchphrase. I think the only difference between the North and the South in Atlanta, it's Bankhead and Buckhead. And the only difference is access, opportunity and exposure. Like you become a doctor because you see a doctor. You can't tell me all the smart people live in the North side of town. Uh, we lose GDP every year because folks on the South side of every town, every city uh, don't believe that their ideas belong in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those examples, I think about generations that I'll never meet. You know, part of my personal motto or mantra is plant seeds that will grow trees whose shade you can never sit under. If we're able to create a thousand more entrepreneurs through the Russell Center, the ripple effect of those thousand in community creates a, a tipping point that more young people will see a pathway to being an entrepreneur or being successful and therefore will yield more entrepreneurs and in literally having a community seeing value in its own reflection. Um, that piece is real for us. And I think that this having the physical epicenter, the structure, uh, a tangible asset that people can look to participate in, touch and feel uh, and see success, a uh, reflection of themselves when they see success is powerful. Um, Atlanta, when we start to think about like our, our entrepreneurial and our small business history, um, you know, we have the benefit of being in honor of one of the greatest entrepreneurs Atlanta's ever produced in H.J. Russell. Uh, so to be in the building that an entrepreneur built, because for context, guys, Mr. Russell, 74 years ago, as a black man in the Jim Crow segregated racist South, had the audacity to build a headquarter building that's a full city block wide and 50,000 square feet. He built it. Uh, hell, that's impossible today during real estate terms in the heart of the city. He built it directly across the street from Morehouse, Clark, Spellman, Morris, Brown, ITC. To your point, Christy, he built it here intentionally. So those students who didn't have the ability by law could not go to the University of Georgia or Georgia Tech or Emory. So those students that matriculated could literally see the physical embodiment of what was possible for students that look like them if they trusted and believed. Um, I think that we're going to carry forward with that legacy. And I think that there's so much talent on uh, in our city that just doesn't get realized. Show me somebody more innovative than a single mother with two kids making 17 grand a year. You can't. The way her grit, her determination, the way she goes after, the way she's able to overcome challenges is really the DNA and the heart of a successful entrepreneur. And we're here to try to connect those dots. And so, you know, I get really excited about the potential of things. Uh, because of the collaborative nature of Atlanta. It's about access. It's not about drawing a moat around the center and saying black people only. It is literally how we can take a community that's never had access to Lisa or has never had access to city or Georgia Tech 
or Emory or all of the resources that we have in the city and start building bridges. It's really about connectivity. So you you kind of alluded to this and I'm just going to dive right in. How since it, this is kind of the premier spot where we see located in Atlanta, it's such a great location. How has Atlanta really embraced this and how are we giving resources to your founders? How is that how is that action being um, implemented for your for your center? You know, we've had a good year. I mean, we raised a little over 27 million in 2020. Um, I put a personal goal out there to raise another 25 million in 2021. Um, you know, companies like Coca-Cola, Truist, uh, Chick-fil-A, you name it around, you know, around the horn of our corporate uh, citizens uh, have contributed. But also I, I never let anybody uh, only have a transactional kind of situation when they hand over a check. I don't believe in just pure philanthropy for the sake of it or charity in that matter. We're talking about empowerment. So literally, how can we start looking at scaling businesses to enter Delta supply chain? How can we look at Georgia Pacific finding a way to make sure uh, that their spend is more equitable? How are we growing companies of scale that create jobs and create hope? Uh, so we've had some good responses, but also because we're able to hold those companies accountable. Uh, you know, we, we are not in the business of just being informative. Uh, we have a goal of being transformative and every partnership that we have you know, they talk about the three legged stool of time, talent and treasure. I think our stool has like 10 legs of what we request of a partner uh, that goes far beyond just cutting a check. Because, uh, you know, I, I talked to a group of entrepreneurs this morning. Like what other city can we get a startup started? And their first clients are Home Depot, Chick-fil-A, Delta, UPS uh, and, and throw in another one. Let's say Google, who's got a presence here. We have that opportunity here. And, and I, I think that that part is powerful. So, yes, to answer your question, uh, I'm not going to let them off the hook and say they've done everything they could, but they certainly have embraced our, our efforts to start to even the playing field. Excellent. Does anyone want to add a comment there? Now, from uh, from my perspective, uh, you know, as we look for <clears throat> commerce tech, right, I'm just from that perspective, there's a lot, I mean, uh, right, you know, like Chase said, there is UPS, there is Coke, there is Home Depot. There are all these very big players, the largest in the world uh, in all their respective categories that call Atlanta their home, right? It owns our headquarters. Uh, actually, in so many years, uh, Atlanta has been called the best state for doing business. Uh, it's one of the top cities for entrepreneurship. But one of the things that we see missing a lot, at least from my perspective, is funding. And uh, funding actually is even worse if you are a diverse founder. Um, I, we, one of the challenges that we face constantly is when we invest in diverse founders, which we have if, uh, quite a few of, we actually uh, have to then help them almost navigate the waters to get other people to fund. Meaning, you know, I mean, we can't be the only ones that keep funding these companies, right? Mm -hmm. So this whole thing about, you know, I, I'd like to fund and we support only people that look like me is a big problem sometimes. And Atlanta is doing very well, but I think I'm sure we could do even better than this. Agreed. Well, it's part of this thing about access. You know, the access is a two-way street. And today's funders, people with money in the bank, and we have more wealth in America than we've ever had. We have more billionaires being created than we ever have. Part of the, where, where does that money need to be put to work? And I think sometimes the existing structure, um, nationally, not just speaking of Atlanta, wants to create programs to put that money to work. But I would posit to, to all of us as an audience, where are the founders? Where are the, the Jay Baileys and the Russell Centers of this world already existing from the community of opportunity that just needs funding? And I think, you know, speaking from the thin slice of venture capital where I operate, we were like, let's not build a brand new program or a brand new strategy. Venture capital works. It just doesn't find enough entrepreneurs who are female and of color. So let's change that. We don't have to change the world. We just need to change our world around us. And if each of us focused on the people in our smaller circle and made sure that we were intentionally inclusive in our leadership, in our team, and in our funding priorities, the world could change like that. Mm. One of the things that I think is really lost is when people who invest in strategies that invest in entrepreneurs don't ask the question, how is your funding being determined along access to opportunity lines that I care about? And maybe that's gender, maybe that's race, maybe that's geography. 
these are legit questions that should be asked of your finance partners. And I think in Atlanta, we do a pretty good job of asking those questions more than a lot of cities. But it's um, it's some love and some, some knowledge we want to spread. And if I can add on to that, Christy, um, one of the things I'll tell you that uh, diversity in teams and diversity with companies that we fund, I mean, it's not just, you know, it's not just for the goodness of your heart. It's smart business. Mm-hmm. I mean, to have people with different points of view sitting around the boardroom, I think that's that's very powerful, right? And the same thing uh, with with companies, meaning, I mean, what was this recent report which said, I mean, literally trillions of dollars are left on the table because women founders and minority founders are not being funded. I mean, where is the responsibility for the investor's capital? You know, and so I think that it just makes a lot of business sense other than just the fact that we, we are going to change the world this way. Yeah, that's Carla Harris's report. I think at Morgan Stanley, excellent report. Um, you know, someone in the comments asked for some stu- some case studies, and I'm going to give you a couple of real quick ones. I believe the entrepreneurs are actually solving the problems that we need to solve. What they need is access to the capital and sometimes mentorship and network. So, for example, Sheena Allen, Valor uh, invested in her first round and then invested in her second round, is the founder of Capway. She's here in Atlanta, a female of color originally from Mississippi. And I tell you what, she has a completely new vision of what a bank should do. And it applies to 20% of the United States. So after we invested, she hustled her way into Y Combinator. She has investment now after we invested from Bessemer and Kosla and other smart money. I have no doubt will join that cap table. But that's an example of just one, you know, Atlanta founder, home growing an idea here that changes the world that she knows very well and is building on her experience. Um, you know, I don't have to tell this room, the United States under 40 is already a majority minority population. So the founders we need to be funding for the future of our American civilization, much less Atlanta, look like America. And, and she is a great example. And, and I have dozens of them. If you go to our portfolio site on valor.bc, you'll see so many of these people. And, and there are, of course, thousands of them. And then one more example for that is uh, Calendly, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. right? Again, black, black founder. And I, I don't know how many people turned them down for investing. And the people that believed in that, in the story and the capability are laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah. And Lee Scurry <laughs> is another. You know, all of these are, are approaching that that high dollar mark that we talked about earlier, you know, when we look at, as Lisa shared earlier, we've got another 25 just ready to hit the billion dollar mark. It's, it's very accurate. And most of those are, you know, either uh, female or uh, minority led companies. So it is, it is something special in Atlanta to be proud of. And we're fostering that. I think, I think we're insulating these founders with um, a certain level of resources that they haven't been able to obtain otherwise. So let's stick with Lisa just for a moment. And I'm going to tell her all the great things that she's done as a trailblazer. But the one thing that you did as a pioneer was start the first one, uh, women in venture capital, woman led venture capital fund in Georgia. I to say it's so rare. <laughs> I know. I know it's so rare, but it's I mean, it's motivated so many of us and it, it you really created kind of this this pioneering, you know, status of we all want to be Lisa. Right. So when you launched that fund in the state of Georgia, you went further. And I mentioned this earlier to create Startup Runway, which is a nonprofit pitch event for women and underserved founders and minority founders. Can you really talk to us about not just staging the fund with this investment thesis that you had, which was unique? Um, but also the headliner to the feeder and the pipeline to start a runway uh, into your investment thesis. So I'd love for you to talk about that. And being first, I think that's important. Thanks, Christy. And I appreciate how you've given your time to start a runway as a judge. So start a runway is a foundation. And it was started by the venture capital firm Valor with sponsors, including Cox Enterprises, our presenting sponsor, and other sponsors like Slalom Consulting out of Seattle and American Family Insurance out of Madison, Wisconsin. Trist has recently joined the ring. So it's a lot of incredible grassroots corporate support. We give away grants 
We give away grants to usually pre-revenue startups founded by underrepresented founders. And by that, we mean historically underrepresented in their access to venture capital. So it's a really specific definition, and it's inclusive of most people of color and women. Um, since we started in 2016, we've had the opportunity to screen hundreds of really exciting business ideas. Usually those founders don't have the privilege of leaving their work and starting their business. Black families in the U.S. have one-tenth the wealth of white families. I mean, of course, there is a need for earlier stage funding than post-revenue seed stage investing that Valor does institutionally. So the foundation is something we share with the venture community. We welcome all angels. We welcome all funds that write a seed stage check because there is such a groundswell of inspiring founders raising their hands to start interesting businesses that solve some of the biggest problems that they know, and they're the ones to solve it. So I invite you all, if you're interested, if you're starting a business or if you're investing in businesses, even very small checks, five and $10,000 can make the difference for someone between I can get someone to professionally code my MVP or I can't even show an MVP. So I would disabuse you of the idea that there's a such a thing as a too small. There's such a thing as not taking the first step. And Startup Runway as a foundation is a first step to connect first check writers to first time founders who are of color or female. Jay, any plans to have a similar pitch event coming out of Reese? I think we should partner. I mean, I think collaboration beats competition, right? So there are are incredible pitch events. You know, as a nonprofit, we kind of keep an arm's length uh, around funding. But, you know, it's it's the type of thing where I introduce entrepreneurs to Lisa's beautiful platform, maybe expand it with some of our resources. But that's the power of Atlanta. It's through collaboration that we all win. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I don't know if I want to recreate the wheel. We got great folks already doing the work. We just got to figure out a better way to work together. Let's do it. I love it. Yeah. And that's that's a live example of Atlanta right there. Did Christy stage that? (laughs) No, no, I didn't. But let's do it. (laughs) We're all trying to do the same thing. So it's just remarkable when we can have this type of forum to bring it together. So oh, any yeah. other comments to, to add to what Lisa's saying? Oh, yeah. No, count me in also. Okay. All yeah. right. We're going to set up this forum. <laughs> Challenge, what, what Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. What you guys are doing is uh, is amazing. Okay. I mean, that yeah. maybe, you, maybe you don't hear it as often as you should because uh, what you guys are doing, I mean, all the three of you, uh, hats off because you have taken on a really heavy load and you are executing so very well. I mean, you know, I know that probably every few few days somebody tells you, I mean, you're wasting your time trying to do something that's impossible. <laughs> and I know that every day you wake up and say, no, you know what? I can change the world. And hats off to you guys for doing that. Amen. What a you nice too, Sam. It's not yeah. like you're not, you're not moving the needle yourself there, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you sleep, Sid, honestly. <laughs> well, you don't have any time. Um, let's stick with you just for a moment because I do want to I do want to talk about Silicon Road Ventures and the extraordinary team and the diverse oversight that that you've given to the fund. Why Atlanta? Uh, I love Atlanta. Mm-hmm. That's the single biggest reason why we are doing this. Um you know, there's a lot of emotion behind this. Uh, Atlanta is home to me. Um, I make this joke that probably you can't tell this from my southern accent, but <laughs> Atlanta is home to me. Okay, and uh, my family is here. My family grew up here. Uh, I love the city. But uh, actually, beyond all the, um, you know, all the emotion, there's also a lot of good business sense here. Okay, um, Atlanta is a big hub of economic powerhouses. There is amazing education. I mean, we haven't talked about the 55,000 graduates, right? There's Georgia Tech, there is UGA, Kennesaw State. I mean, Georgia State, I mean, Kennesaw State actually has students that are homeless. I don't know if you knew that, okay? Something like 60% of the students at Kennesaw State are first time graduates in their family. And that's a big number, right? Mm -hmm. Given the third largest university system in the the, uh, state. And uh, <clears throat> the passion that you see there, the scrappiness, 
of all these guys that really want to make a difference. They want to change, elevate themselves and their families. I mean, that's that's breathtaking. Okay, and so um, there is there is a lot of goodness to be had here. The problem is, or actually, it's an opportunity, right? I mean, the opportunity is that nobody has really taken these steps yet to convert this into the startup and innovation powerhouse that it, this city could be. So whatever we are trying to do here is not, um, you know, it's it's not irrational at all. I mean, I think there's lots of opportunity, and I think if we mm-hmm. look back at this, um, you know, at this panel. Maybe ten years from now, we'll say, "Wow, you know, yes, Atlanta is where it should be." And building on that, your focus with Silicon mm-hmm. Ventures is really fintech, supply and logistics, retail tech, and commerce. What what really is the network effect of that? I think I might know some of the answers, but I would love for you to talk about the Atlanta community that really has enhanced the growth of your fund here and also maybe outline your investment thesis? Yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> so very quickly, again, uh, recapping what the fund does, uh, we are a $31 million fund, and we are focused on commerce tech, which is basically technologies that are either disrupting or enabling retail e-commerce and CPG. And uh, we invest in C through Series A. We invest only in US companies. However, obviously, most of the focus is Atlanta. Six out of our 10 startups are Atlanta based. Um, so we see a lot of great momentum here because, for example, a prior CEO of Home Depot is one of our investors. Um, great story there because I've still not met him. Hmm. Right? It's all done on Zoom. Right? And uh, he actually not just invested, but he doubled down because he too believes in the city and he believes in what we are trying to do. Uh, we have uh, senior execs from FISO, uh, from Honeywell, uh, from Macy's and so on and so forth. Macy's, as you know, has a very large IT presence here in the uh, city also. So we, we uh, are trying to really bring together this coalition of people that both understand and are experts in commerce, as well as people that love the city. And we have been able to really find a great group of people doing that. And um, there are several, several startups that are either moved to Atlanta or are going to do so because of all these different Mm-hmm. initiative that we are doing. So, of course, part of CDL, for example, uh, my condition for supporting CDL, the Creative Destruction Labs, was that the commerce stream has to be launched from Atlanta, and which we have done. There are you know two dozen startups in that program, and many of them will hopefully move to Atlanta also. So there are all these great network effects which are really accelerating. Anything to add, Jay or Lisa? I know I was asking specifically about about Sid's fund, but would love for you to talk more about the attraction of, of startups coming here. Well, I tell you what, you can't find a leader like Sid to invest in your startup at such a small stage. Mm-hmm. Like with 31 million, he writes a decent sized check, but brings that kind of power to it. So, I mean, it's just another example of, I think, why the Atlanta ecosystem is such an interesting point right now. Yeah, and I love what you said, Sid, about, you know, from Home Depot to Fiserv to to all of these companies that have chipped in and said, you know what, we want to be a part of the solution. I mean, if we redefine what the Atlanta way is going forward in an economic lens rather than through like civil rights, that's the new way forward. That those of us that have the capacity, we do everything that we can to to pour into uh, the better future for Atlanta. It's going to help all of us, guys. When we start talking about like racial lines and all, it's going to help all of us. If there is more wealth flowing through our communities, it helps us all. And, you know, there are, I think, three or four comments there asking if they should all move to Atlanta. And I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to address those comments before the next question, but yes, there are several who are asking, you know, out loud, when when should I move here and should I move here? And I think we would all tell you yes, but we've all had, you know, great support. I think all four of us have been founders in this community and have had exits in this community. And we could probably talk about the absorption of, of the kind of geography of being supportive. And if I'm not misspeaking, you know, Sid, you included, we're all native to Atlanta. We've all been raised here in some capacity. Me in an area called Inman Park. Lisa, you were, you, your city was where? Well, technically I was raised just outside of Macon, Roberta, Georgia. That's what I thought, okay. Yeah. A little different. 
but still that? part of Georgia, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, we've all kind of put roots down here and this is still, this is still my HQ no matter where I live. So it's, mm -hmm. it's always home. Um, I do want to talk about reinvestment because we've, we've shined the line on all the, the amazing positive things that are happening in this ecosystem and these great companies that are scaling to a billion plus. Can we talk about getting founders to reinvest in our future? Can we um, maybe take a line there of how, how we make that attractive for uh, founders who are so profitable and growing? Jay, can we start with you? Your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the my mantra is community culture covenant. Community culture covenant. It, if we're under the same covenant, why we're doing this? What's our, re our responsibility to ourselves? What's our commitment to this thing that we're developing, growing, and building? And what's our obligation to the greater community that exists outside of our walls? Um, I think panels like this, uh, organizations like Lisa's, uh, spaces like the Gathering Spot you know, places like the Russell Center start to build this culture and community. And if we live under covenant, it's one of the things that made Silicon Valley successful. Mm -hmm. That if you got a company, you know, there's a big exit and now you have 50 new millionaires. Those 50 new millionaires pour that money into a couple of different companies that creates another 50 millionaires. And those new millionaires to keep pouring in and keep pouring in, we've just not reached that point. Like we've got a couple of decent exits where you got like five rich guys. Or we've got a couple of decent exits where you got like two rich guys. And as we starting, you know, it will happen over time as we mature. Uh, but I think that that part is where if I love Lisa enough, if I know Sid enough, if we broken bread, Christy, it almost becomes culture. that It, it becomes a, a badge of honor to be able to pour back into community. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to be intentional and deliberate about not only holding those, uh, you know, those those companies accountable, but not even about holding them accountable, creating the kind of culture where, you know what, it's just what we do. Well, and with yeah. the money there, that's what we do. And we hold we hold each other to that, to that kind of cultural covenant standard rather than just accountability. That part takes us a lot further. Well, I think it's evolving for us. So just to be honest, I mean, Atlanta has a lot of strengths and an area that's a real frontier for us is exactly what we're talking about. I can speak from my own experience that we have over 35 founders in my fund and they're in Atlanta. And don't worry, y'all, I'm not going to call out each of your names, <laughs> but there's a lot of women in there. There are people of color in there and, and there are plenty of visionary white guys in there. And they're not just coming with a check. They're coming with let me know if I can help, okay? And a lot of times our founders are talking with them constantly. How do I close this kind of a deal with a company I've never worked with before? I have this other type of investor wanting to write me a convertible note, but I just took a seed round and I don't know what to do. There are a lot of opportunities, I think, for founders to give back, but we haven't let that map be clear for them yet mm. because they have been undercapitalized. There have historically only been a small handful venture funds at the founding company stage where founders have relevant and experience and advice to give. So, you know, to do a comparison in Silicon Valley, there are 800 funds. <laughs> and we talk about, oh, is Atlanta overpopulated with 20? No, we are not. But the density of, of funds that have cultural fits for the founders that we're producing isn't optimized yet. And it's one of the most exciting things we can do is mm -hmm. Founders put that that harder knowledge and wisdom to work and pay it forward in their own communities. I don't think that path has been easy for them in the past. It's only just now clarifying. Amen. Yep, absolutely. Said any thoughts there? No, actually, you know, I know that there are lots of people that, you know, after their exit, they leave the city or they don't invest back into the city. I, I think that's personally, uh, that's not a very smart thing to do. But there are also examples of great founders who have invested back into the city and not just in investment in, ter in terms of looking for a return. Uh, obviously, the names that stand out are you know, Arthur Blank, Bernie Marcus. Mm -hmm. um, there is Guys Veda, right? CEO, ex-CEO of Coke. And all of these are legendary in terms of how they are totally transforming the city. But also people like David Cummings, you know, I mean, hats off to him. You know, he could have very easily also walked off into the sunset, but he decided to invest back into the city and he has done very well, too. So and, you know, he was one of the investors in Calendly, by the way. Mm -hmm. Right. So 
I'm, I'm glad. I'm so glad that he's kind of also kind of leading the way in that respect. But there are many others. And I, uh, my advice to anybody who has had exits is to really look at the city because, you know, you don't have those, um, you know, totally unreasonable, illogical valuations, for example, right? Uh, especially if the startups, startup is being led by, a, by either a woman or a black founder. So I think there is opportunity here that cannot be had anywhere else. Great summary. I do want to get to some of the audience questions in our last 10 minutes together. MK had a had a great one who who's asking when he arrive he or she arrives in Atlanta, uh, where do I go to first get into the jam of this amazing ecosystem and the new future um, out of office working in people? So just the gathering spot. <laughs> I was going to say. For, you know, one thing you would name, Lisa. It's a portfolio firm. I love them. The gathering spot, you will feel the city in an authentic Mm -hmm. way. The arts community is there. The business community is there. The corporate community is there. And the food is great. So I would say go to the gathering spot. Um, What would y'all suggest? Absolutely. I mean, I think if, if you hang out at Fifth Street, if you go to the gathering spot, if you come by RCIE, if you... Go to a Braves game. I mean, like it, it, there, it's literally in every direction. Um, and I think people are still people are still nice with no economic reason for no economic reason. Right. Like I'll still say hello and have a beer or have a conversation without trying to understand what I can get from the conversation. I love that about Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And so if someone comes to the city and is open enough to be vulnerable enough to not have it all right, to not think they got it all figured out and not think they're running into our city to be the savior of Atlanta. Uh, just come on down, man. There, there are lots of options, but you can't, you can't go wrong with any of the ones we've named thus far. Good. What's uh, your thought? Yeah, I, mean, I would say definitely don't forget the ATDC. Uh, so just for people that are not, not from Atlanta, ATDC is the Advanced Technology Development Center, uh, which is really the state of Georgia's incubation facility. Been here since, believe it or not, 1980. Mm-hmm. Right. So 41 years old. Um, John Avery, uh, Jane McCracken, they are the two fearless leaders of this organization. They have coached and um, had successful uh, exits for hundreds of startups over the years. And uh, it's a great organization. What Jay was saying about people wanting to give back selflessly, a lot of those people gather at ATDC. So if you're in the city, I mean, it costs, I think, 25 bucks a quarter, which is a princely sum, right? Uh, you can very easily get the benefit of all of that. Let me jump in here, giving a shout out to my partner, Robin Bian Fay, the former chief innovation officer at Samsung. She built a 45,000 square foot innovation center um, that's for corporate and really global innovation. Over 100 entrepreneurs work out of that co-working space. Over half of them are from another country. And so I'm telling you, it is just a melting pot of innovation and ideas. So Atlanta Tech Park, especially if you're around corporate enterprise or global innovation, is an extremely cool place to hang out. Yeah, and you said David Cummings can't forget about ATV and Atlanta Tech Village. I mean, just... You know, there, there's, there's, it's here. It's here. Yeah, and Priya, you mentioned that in in your chat. Atlanta Tech Village really is kind of the initial incubus, or you know, it's the fourth largest uh, incubator of startups in the country, and that was built on the premise of, of the foundation of giving entrepreneurs a place to gather, um, as well as the gathering spot. So I'll add my two cents. I'm not going to talk specifically about Atlanta because there is a significant ecosystem around Georgia. Um, ATDC has a presence in Savannah. Uh, we also have Alpharetta um, Tech Corridor led by CEO Karen Cashin north of the city. That's phenomenal. Um, we have, you know, Valdosta State putting out just a huge startup ecosystem. And of course, we can't negate what's happening Although I'd like to, because I went to Georgia Tech, uh, what's happening in Athens, Georgia with University of Georgia, their ecosystem and innovation hub that they're building is incredible. Um, and we're also lucky to have Emory University um, held by, you know, a, an expert, Amelia Schaffner, who's who's really been a, a headliner in creating an innovation 
um, enterprise out of the business school, because what a business school there. So there is so much to be had, not just across the state, but as I said, kind of opening up this conversation, Atlanta is this hub and spoke model across the Southeast. So we could even talk about Greenville. We can talk about uh, Nashville. We can talk about Birmingham. There's all sorts of things happening around with Atlanta being really a, a central force, I think, across the startup um ecosystem of, of what's happening. So you guys are welcome to add comments, but I, I definitely appreciate Priya for calling out uh, Atlanta Tech Village as well. And then um, there are you know, so many comments here that we may not get to, but as we wrap up, any final thoughts, Sid, maybe starting with you? Yeah, so first of all, uh, thanks to 500 Startups. Thanks to you, Christy. And it is great to speak with uh, you guys, Jay and Lisa. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, what I would say in conclusion is, that Atlanta is where probably Silicon Valley was 25 years ago. Uh, I think the opportunity is now. I think that we all should make a concerted effort to, you know, to kind of promote this whole thing around diversity, inclusion, and uh, Atlanta can really lead the world in that. Absolutely agree. How about you, Lisa? I would just say if you're outside of Atlanta and you think that Atlanta is really a little bit different, we are. And you owe it to yourself if you're attracted to that energy to come check it out. You know, use an Airbnb. Oh, they're opening a huge headquarters here. Use an Airbnb and come see what the vibe is all about. Uh, stay on the belt line. Check out a few things. And, and I think you'll really, you'll feel it for yourself. Why there's a special place here for founders in particular. And for investors who want something different, want something more. Thank you for that. I, I failed to mention the belt line. That was perfect. Jay? I mean, that's it, though. We're just getting started. Like, it's already amazing. And we're still on one. Like, out of 10, we're on one. And when we think about the capacity and the capability of this city fulfilling its promise to entrepreneurs and small business owners, uh, when you get the belt line that starts to connect the entire community, where I can go from one side of town to the other without ever hopping in a car, um, you know, the African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think Atlanta has the capacity to go far because we're going to go together. Great. Thank you for that. I'm, I actually just typed that proverb in. That's perfect. <laughs> I don't want to go fast. I, I don't want to go alone, actually. So <laughs> I have such an appreciation that through this pandemic, I, I need so many people now. Um, mm -hmm. Just to recap, Atlanta, you know, we're we're definitely selling the dream and talking about our ecosystem because we've all lived it and so grateful for this audience and this amazing panel to be here. Anytime I can be in the presence of of greatness, uh, I feel it. And, and with Lisa, Jay and Sid, it's definitely that. So thank you for participating. Thank you to 500 Startups for asking us to do this. Talk about our city, what achievements are here and where we think the future is going. Um, just quick recap, we've got low cost of living, as Sid said, affordable to dream here. Um, and this is a Mecca and it's a Mecca for all founders. And I think it's it's got a lot of opportunity as we step into this new decade of opportunity. So if any final words, please shout them out now. If not, thank you for being here. And I, Christy Brown, am grateful to be part of this group here in Atlanta. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Take care. Thank you. Be well.